this week on the Back Table Podcast. And what happened next was that the uh, ablation started to form and it looked really good. And we're all like, wow, this is a great ablation. But then we looked over and the microwave oven started to smoke and the sparks started to fly between the waveguide and the microwave oven. And we all dove for cover and, uh, and ran around behind the safety wall. And, uh, and the thing basically exploded. Luckily, nobody was injured. But I remember Dan standing there with these safety glasses on looking like, you know, Doc Brown out of, yep. <laughs> out of uh, Back to the Future. Yep. And we're like, oh my God, you know, there's this big explosion. And, you know, we're looking between the microwave oven and then we look at this ablation that we formed, which is really good. But the whole thing's like smoking and, you know, not working well. And, and Dan's like, cool, man, this is really cool. You know? <laughs> hey, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Innovation Podcast. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and of course on Backtable.com. This is our next installment in the Backtable Innovation Show, where you're going to hear stories from physician entrepreneurs who are helping to drive healthcare forward through medtech innovation. This is Brian Hartley as your host this week. I'm a radiologist living in Nashville and co-founder of an early stage imaging company in the pulmonary space. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest this week, Dr. Fred Lee. Fred is an interventional radiologist and professor at the University of Wisconsin. He is a world-renowned researcher, innovator, and successful entrepreneur. He is the founder of three venture-backed startup companies with a successful exit of New Wave to J&J &J Ethicon in 2016. This will be the first of a multi-part show on the genesis, the rise, and by that I mean trials and tribulations, and the acquisition of New Wave. So with that, Fred, thank you so much for joining me today. It's my pleasure to be here, Brian. Awesome. Okay, so let's dive right in. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, or a lot uh, about yourself and, and your background? Where do you practice now? Well, I'm a radiologist at the University of Wisconsin, where I'm a professor of radiology and biomedical engineering and urology. And my practice is I do abdominal imaging about 50% of the time and interventional about 50% of the time. Uh, I work in a large uh, university, which has uh, a very uh, large basic and clinical science component. Uh, we are one of the largest research universities in the world. And I think it's within that context that I found myself uh, becoming an entrepreneur. And we'll talk yeah. about that more as, as time goes on. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And uh, do you have any research projects right now? Sure. Right now, I'm working primarily on histotripsy, which is a non-invasive non-ionizing, uh, non-thermal ablation modality. That's really an ultrasound, uh, focused ultrasound method of destroying tissue. Our lab is working on that. And I have some great partners, Tim Zemlevich uh, and Paul Lasky that I'm working on with primarily. And uh, we're trying to drive that into, uh, into clinical adoption. And you know, you're, you're world renowned for ablation. Maybe you can give us a little background. How did you come to be interested in and, and become such an expert in, in, in percutaneous ablation and, and ablation in general? Well, it's a long story, Brian, and, and it goes back a little ways. Would you indulge me a little bit and maybe Please. I'll tell you a little history? Please do. Okay. Because I, I really am a firm believer that everybody is a product of their environment and of their history. And, and I, as I look back on my life and career, I certainly think that that is true. Um, our family is, we're an immigrant family. My grandmother and grandfather came to the United States in 1918. And uh, my grandfather actually went back to China in 1927 to marry my grandmother in an arranged marriage they had, they had never met before. My grandfather was an orphan and he was in Southern China and he left because there were no prospects for him. He was a, a dirt poor farmer with no education. And he realized that there was no future as an orphan um, in, at that time in, in China. And so they ended up in Buffalo, where my grandmother uh, ran a Chinese laundry. And my grandfather uh, ran a series of restaurants, most of which failed. So the family uh, mostly grew up during the Depression and through World War II. And there were seven children. They had to assimilate. And they all were very successful scholastically. My father ended up going to the University of Buffalo and graduating number one in the medical school class there. But 
he may not have been the most accomplished academically of the, of the children. We had one of his older sisters was an incredible student and was a pharmacist, which was unusual at the time for a woman. The oldest son, Frank, became an aeronautical engineer and led missile programs for Bell uh, Aeronautical. Wow. Uh, I have two other uncles who are both physicians. One is a plastic surgeon who's retired in San Francisco, Howard. And uh, Larry is a retired hand surgeon, orthopedic surgeon in Rhode Island. I have another uncle, Luther, who's a dentist, and uh, he still lives in Buffalo, New York. He's the only one that still lives there. And my aunt's Rose was a pharmacist. Unfortunately, she passed away a couple of years ago from renal cell. And uh, I have another aunt who's 90 years old, Elsie, who's a university administrator, was a university administrator before she retired. So a very accomplished family who just pulled themselves out of the ghetto by mostly sheer hard work. And I mean, they had some natural gifts, obviously, but a lot of it was sheer hard work and they are all incredibly successful. And I'm really proud of them. That's where I come from. Wow. And, and yeah, tell us about how, you know, I can, I can tell where you get your drive. I mean, that's, that's obviously it's a family. It's a, it's, it's the culture of your family. So how does, uh, I see you had a couple physicians in the family. Uh, where did your interest in ablation come? I think the story then picks up with my father who graduated from medical school and wanted to be a surgeon. And for maybe 10, 15 or 20 years, just practiced general radiology as a private practice doctor and nothing special about his career. He was extraordinarily good, of course, and did a really good job and is still well known in that community as a general radiologist. But I think the turning point in his life was in the early 1980s when transrectal ultrasound became available. Uh, they were doing demos and they said, what the heck, we'll demo on each other. And he did a demo on himself and diagnosed himself with prostate cancer. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so that was, he was, I think he was less than 50 at that point. And of course, this was a major shock. You know, here's a guy, he was incredibly physically fit. He was a very competitive tennis player mm -hmm. and a runner and uh, was really shocked to understand that this could be the end of his life. And they tried to operate on him and they did intraoperative sampling of his iliac lymph nodes, which were all positive. Mm. And so they closed him. He ended up getting some radiation therapy and shockingly survived another 30 years after that and, and only oh died gosh. in 2016. So, so that was really amazing. But I think the, the impact that it made on him was that he, as a physician and as a scientist, he realized that the state of prostate cancer diagnosis and treatment was very primitive back in the, in the early eighties. And he is an incredibly focused and driven person. And based on his own diagnosis and, and what he knew about the field, he decided that he was going to become a prostate cancer researcher based in private practice, which was crazy. And he ended up publishing over a hundred papers. He's the one that introduced PSA to the, to the world. He didn't invent it, but he did the first clinical trial on PSA. For those of you listening that read prostate MRI, he's the one that described the zonal anatomy of the prostate. So every time you use the word peripheral zone or transition zone, those are all his contributions. Wow. He introduced the concept of PSA density to the world also. And he was the first person in the United States to use the biopsy gun, uh, which at that time was a fringe device invented in Sweden. And he brought that to the United States and popularized the use of, of, you know, the, I mean, all of us now use versions of, of that device in our everyday practice. So those are some of the contributions uh, that he made. I remember when I was a medical student. He would travel all over the country and all over the world lecturing about prostate cancer. And in his own practice, presidents and senators and kings would fly in to, to be diagnosed and staged by him. And wow. eventually he ran into a guy uh, named Gary Onick, who I believe is responsible for the introduction of ablation, frankly, uh, in the world. And I think Gary doesn't get enough credit for that. Gary had started cryoablation and this was boy, really early eighties, 81 or 82 when Gary started that as a resident and uh, Gary was at Pittsburgh for a while and he was at 
at Deaconess, I believe, in Boston and at UCSF. And uh, during that time, Gary was interested in ablation and nobody else in our world was, nobody in the surgery world was. The devices had just started to come out, were very primitive and very large in diameter. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gary taught my dad about this. And Gary had been doing some prostate cryoablation and uh, had a fairly robust practice at Pittsburgh, taught my father how to do it. And the two of them kind of went crazy and did thousands of patients with really, really good results. I mean, very minimal morbidity. People uh, had low complication rates, retained potency in many cases, mm -hmm. were not incontinent. Those were all complications of radical prostatectomy. And uh, they were able to overcome that and control cancer in, in most cases. And so the results were really, really good. Yeah, you could definitely at this point jump into your, how you became interested in ablation. So I grew up with a physician, father, who is a scientist who is publishing and studying, studying prostate cancer. But the one thing that he lacked was a lab. And during this time I had finished training and, and I came to the University of Wisconsin and I had an animal lab that I was doing various studies in. And I said to my father, you know, this ablation thing is kind of interesting, but how do you know that what you're targeting and what you're covering with the ice ball is actually dead? And he didn't. And he said, well, we're doing, you know, biopsies afterwards. And, and of course, as you know, percutaneous biopsies have a lot of sampling error. And how do you know that every cell in the ablation zone is dead, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so he admitted that they really didn't. So they, he came to the University of Wisconsin and we did a series of experiments, animal studies to show in fact that, that this was an effective treatment. And so he and I had worked on several research papers together. And so he had taught me quite a bit about the scientific method, but I really didn't want to apply to prostate. And I felt like kidney and liver cancer and even lung cancer to some degree were under, I, I mean, these were very good opportunities to apply ablation techniques to, to those particular cancers. But as I mentioned earlier, the fundamental problem was that the devices were so primitive, they were primarily liquid nitrogen systems with eight millimeter diameter probes. And, you know, putting an eight millimeter diameter probe into a vascular organ is just asking for trouble. And so we were fairly limited to doing intraoperative ablations where I would work with uh, some really good surgeons here at Wisconsin. They would open the abdomen. We would go in and place probes using intraoperative ultrasound. And then when we pulled the probes out, when we thawed the ice wall and pulled the probes out, we had to shove a cigarette of Surgicel into the hole because it was bleeding so badly. Yeah. I mean, there's just blood pouring out of these holes. And, and that really slowed me down thinking about how we're going to do this percutaneously, having watched firsthand the bleeding episodes that happen intraoperatively. So, so we needed a technological break for, for us to get into percutaneous. And so around that time in the late eighties, there was a company called Endocare that had formed and they had the idea not to use liquid nitrogen for cooling, but to use pressurized argon gas. And the argon of course had a lower viscosity than liquid nitrogen. And that allowed us to put the coolant through smaller caliber probes than what we're using with liquid nitrogen. Uh, those probes now got down to about three millimeters and smaller. And that introduced the era of percutaneous cryoablation. So I was looking at these probes and, and I called my buddy, Peter Littrup and, and Peter will figure more into this story later because he's a very important figure. And Peter uh, was a radiologist who spent a year as my father's fellow in the late eighties studying prostate cancer and, and cryoablation. And I called him up and I said, Hey, Peter, you know, we've got these little probes. What do you think about? putting these percutaneously into the kidney and the liver. And next thing I know, Peter flew out to Wisconsin and me and Peter and my partner, Lewis Hinshaw, we started putting these probes into pigs and pulling, you know, making ablations and pulling them out and waiting for the pig to bleed to death. Mm. And, uh, and shockingly they, they didn't. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so we're saying, okay, now we've, we, we thought in a way we thought it was going to fail. And now we knew we had to put it into humans uh, when it didn't fail. And so that's the origin of percutaneous cryoablation. And Peter especially went on to champion this. And, and we did a, some studies at Wisconsin and Peter did some studies at Wayne State. And that 
started the whole field of percutaneous cryoablation, which is, is pretty big today. And, uh, and I, I give Peter most of the credit for, for driving that because, you know, he saw the imaging characteristics and the speed of the ice ball formation and the lack of complications, especially lack of pain. And he saw how that could really translate into a, an effective percutaneous treatment. And, and he's, he's done some amazing things, uh, you know, based on our, our very primitive early work. So, um, so I, I have to give a shout out to Peter. Oh um, yeah. And, and how did you make the jump then from cryo to radio frequency? Yeah. So about that time, the Italian, you know, Gigi Silviati and Nakam Goldberg and Damien Dupuy were, were looking at some early prototypes of radio frequency and, you know, history often converges, you know, and, and we were looking at the cold side and they were looking at the heat side and kind of coming to the same point where, uh, where we figured, uh, both groups figured that, that we could put in needles through the skin, not have patients bleed to death or have other major complications and create tissue destruction at the, at the point where the, where the needle was placed. And the RF groups, the Italian groups and, and the mass general group, which was Nakam and Damien all kind of came to the same sort of conclusions and, and they were able to do with heat, what we were able to do with cold. And so I decided that, you know, if someone is practicing this field, there are going to be times when you're going to want to use heat and there's going to be times where you're going to want to use cold. And the lesson I think we learned from Solbiati and Goldberg and, and Damien was that the, especially in patients with liver failure, they do not tolerate uh, freezing very well. And, uh, we had a couple of unfortunate incidents where patients went into liver failure with even making small ice balls in their, in their liver. But for some reason, and I don't think we still completely understand this, they did tolerate heat really well. And so I knew for those patients, we were going to probably have to use some sort of heat-based treatment. And so I called up Nakam and, and he told me a lot about this cool tip system that he was working with and that Damien was working with. And so we decided to adopt that in, in our practice and it worked pretty well. And I remember the early days where, you know, we were putting in these needles into people. And of course, heat is a little bit harder to see than ice is, um, especially with CT guidance. And so you have to use ultrasound guidance for this. And, you know, we were putting these needles into people and hoping that it was going to, going to work. And, and for the most part it did. And we were able to make uh, a pretty significant contribution to patients with hepatocellular cancer in particular, you know, with the systems of, of their time. But, you know, the one thing is that I'm a pretty impatient person and anybody that works with me will, will tell you that. And the, one of the features of the cool tip system, and maybe the genius behind the cool tip system is that when you're ablating tissue, you're boiling tissue and that the dehydration of the tissue creates both kind of desiccated tissue and charring, which is an insulator. And so it, it's a self-limited process, radio frequency ablation is. And so one of the incredible things that Nakam primarily and, and Gigi Solbiati came up with is that they both cooled the system to prevent charring, and then they turned the system on and off to prevent overheating and kind of over dehydration of the tissue. And that was a very big advance and that allowed ablation zones to become bigger and more clinically relevant. If you don't have cooling or you don't have this kind of on and off switching that's going on, the, the ablations are quite small. And the original description of, of this was, was, was John McGann um, at UC Davis had, had really kind of come up with a concept of radio frequency ablation. And he made some really nice ablations, except they were, they were just too small. And it was the addition of the cool tip that allowed us to get a little bit more clinically relevant ablations, but they were still small and they were still limited. And I found myself frustrated, um, using that system where we would be sitting there and, and as the ablation went on and the tissue got more dehydrated and the uh, impedance would rise, the system would be on and off all the time to the point where I realized that, geez, towards the end of the 12 minute ablation, the system's only on for maybe a minute and it could be off for, you know, five minutes. And so I started thinking to myself, you know, I'm sitting here twiddling my thumbs for five minutes. I'm, I'm not a very good joke teller. 
And so after a few minutes, you're sitting there just staring into space and, and time seems to stand still. And so I started thinking to myself, well, wouldn't it be great if during that off time, you could power additional probes? So what is preventing us from putting a second probe or a third probe in? And when the system turns itself off to prevent itself from overheating and causing charring and desiccation, why couldn't you just power another probe? And so I thought about this a lot and I just, you know, I, I didn't really understand why this would not be possible. But I looked around and I looked at myself in the mirror and, you know, I studied history in college. And so people tell you, I, I know a lot about history and you probably heard a little bit of that in my introduction <laughs> when I was telling about our family, but um, I'm not an engineer and I knew that I would not be able to do this myself. And so, of course, being in this environment, uh, we have one of the world's best engineering schools here. And the University of Wisconsin Hospital is on the undergraduate campus. And so one day, just on a lark, I walked over to the engineering school and I started knocking on doors of engineering professors. This is not, I'm not kidding. This was 1995, maybe, or 1994, I can't remember. And I had no other way of knowing or, or finding someone that might be able to help me. And so I knocked on doors of, of professors. And of course, you can imagine the look on some of the faces of these engineering professors, like, what are you talking about? And, you know, this Chinese, you know, radiology professor, who, you know, is coming up with this random story about burning tissue and all this stuff. And I, I got thrown out of more offices than I, I, I care to care to remember until finally I ran into one professor who said to me, you know, what you're describing sounds a lot like what John Webster is working on. And I'm like, who's John Webster? He said, well, he's an expert in the introduction of electrical current into the human body. And so I'm like, well, I, I need to meet this guy. And so I'm like, well, how does, how does an engineering professor know anything about electrical current in the human body? Well, it turns out that John invented the taser. And so, so I think he, he was more, he, he knew more about electrical current than every, than anybody uh, did. And he was doing some experiments on, on the taser to make them safer and, and, uh, to make them more humane. I, I believe, I, I don't know all of his work on, on taser, but it was fairly advanced uh, for the time. And so I thought this is the exact person that I need to talk to. And so I walked into his office one day and explained the problem. And he said, you know, I think that we can do this. And he realized how to do it. And he assigned a graduate student to me. His name was Dieter Hamrick. And Dieter is from Austria, incredibly smart guy. And Dieter, within a few days, had whipped up a prototype on, on how to do this. And so, you know, we took this prototype, which was, I mean, it looked every bit of a prototype, you know, it had alligator clips and, you know, electrical tape and things, you know, he was soldering things to each other. I mean, it was, it was a prototype. And what was the, what was the novelty again of the, of this prototype from what uh, you had yeah. seen? What was the advancement? Yeah. So what Dieter hooked up is he hooked up a sophisticated electronic switch that would uh, sense when one of the probes, uh, the, the probe that we put into the tissue reached its peak and had stopped powering. And during that rest time, uh, he set up a sophisticated switch that would switch to a second probe and power that one while the first one was resting. And yeah. so uh, it was a, it was a switch. I mean, it was a, it was an electronic switch and, uh, it was, there's more sophistication to it than that, obviously, but that is the fundamental design. Okay. And so we, Dieter and I, and John Webster, we took this switch to the, our tech transfer office, which is called Wharf. And here at the university of Wisconsin, you know, this is one of the most advanced technology transfer institutions in the world. I mean, here we've been, we invented Coumadin, which is Warfarin, which is what Warf is named after. It's the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. 5FU was invented here. Sun Protection Factor, the Integrated Circuit. Chuck Mistretta in our department invented digital subtraction angiography. Um, and so we have a very, vitamin D was invented here. We have a very rich history in stem cells. I mean, all kinds of things came out of Wisconsin and were transferred to companies and into clinical use through Warf. And so Dieter and I, you know, we walked over to Wharf one day and of course we knew nobody and uh, we knocked on doors again and we said, geez, you know, we have this invention and we think that it could be clinically relevant. And we ended up working with Wharf to 
make a patent on it. And, uh, you know, if you're at an institution at a university in particular, and you work with your tech transfer office, the way it works is that the office will front the money that you need to, to file a patent because that that's very expensive. That can be very pricey depending on, you know, what, if you want to file internationally and what you want to cover and, and how complex it is, it can be really pricey more tens than of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands. Exactly. And, you know, as university professors, you're not sure whether this has commercial traction or not. And so it's quite a risk for you to put that money up front only to find out that, that it has no use and nobody wants it. So the, the tech transfers can be a great way to de-risk at least the patent filing process while still allowing you to evaluate the technology, market it, develop it. Exactly. And, and Wharf is very well known for this. And one of the amazing things about Wharf is that they're not just a middleman that, you know, funds patents and, you know, pitches them out over the wall and hopes something happens with them, but they not only do the patenting, but they do licensing as well. And maybe even more importantly is that they support um, young investigators. And I'll, I'll just take a minute to talk about Wharf because I think most universities have something like this, but right. yep. Wharf is, is considered, I think the, the granddaddy, the grandparent of, of this kind of office. And what Wharf does is they will do things like invest in startups from, from the university. They have classes where they teach people how to do startups. They introduce business people to professors that are prospective entrepreneurs, and they fund some of this and they fund the companies. And then even maybe more important is that a lot of the money that Wharf brings in through licensing and patents and royalties and all that stuff, they turn back to, as a gift to the university to fund future research. So it's a wonderful cycle. It's this golden circle that happens here where, you know, Wharf is taking professors' inventions and then taking the money made from those inventions and putting it back into the university. And I benefited from this in just, in every, every way possible, you know, I benefited from Wharf's expertise and, and Dieter and I certainly did. So you guys filed patents or, or filed provisional patents. You continued working on the switching technology. Uh, at what point did you engage potential companies? So, uh, as you can imagine, this was a fairly small world mm -hmm. and there weren't very many people that were working in ablation at all at that time. I mean, really it was, when I think about it in the United States, in, in Europe, there were, they were a little bit more advanced than we were, I believe, but in the mm -hmm. United States, it was Nakam and Damien on the East coast. And they were, there was us in the Midwest and Mayo Clinic you know, Bill Charbonneau and uh, Tom Atwell and those guys in, in Mayo Clinic, Matt Kallstrom were, were working on it. And then David Liu and Steve Raymond at UCLA were working on it. And besides, you know, those four or five universities there, and, and Peter, of course, uh, was at Wayne State. And besides those four or five places, there really wasn't much activity going on in the United States. And so this was a small club and we all knew each other and we're all very close friends and worked together on this. And so industry, you know, knew that there was, you know, four or five of us and, and was kind of always watching what everybody was doing. Um, I was presenting some of these results at some of the major meetings and my friends were using some of the devices and, and we're talking about it and sharing all this. And, and of course, industry had their eye on this. And I was approached by several companies about you know, potentially commercializing this, this particular technology. And of course, as a doctor, you know, we, I, I always felt like I invented things. I I'm interested in inventions that I want to use on my patients to have a better outcome. And I, I know, you know, this Brian, every time you go in to do a procedure on somebody, and especially if the procedure doesn't work, you have to face the family and you have to face the patient and explain why it didn't work. And, and one of my sayings, our residents and fellows hear me say all the time is that, you know, I do a good enough job making myself look stupid and I don't need anybody else's help. And I don't, I don't need a help from a suboptimal piece of equipment. And, you know, I, I feel like, you know, we failed enough that we know that some of it was our fault, but some of it was the equipment's fault too. And, and we just needed to do a better job and we needed better devices. And so I. Uh, was approached by a company about, uh, about commercializing this. And they ended up coming to Wisconsin and we did an animal lab 
Mm -hmm. and they liked what they saw and decide to license it and work through Worf. And how that works is then Worf will grant a exclusive worldwide license to the company in return for royalties. And of course, the, the downside of working through an institution and through a tech transfer office is that most of the royalties then reside at the tech transfer office and at the university and less goes to the inventors. And I didn't figure that that was a problem. I mean, Worf earned every dollar that they ever, right. they ever earned. And so, you know, I think it was a fair exchange. Um, I didn't have any risk at the time and, and, uh, financial risk. That's right. Right. That's right. They were taking all the risk and, you know, they're the ones that hired the attorneys and they're the ones that negotiate licenses and stuff like that. So, so I don't think that's a problem at all. I think for any particular inventor, you know, they just have to make the choice about how much risk they're willing to take on at that point in their life. And, you know, being a junior faculty member and in academic practice with a young family, I, I wasn't super interested in taking a ton of financial risk and maybe more important, I didn't know how to do anything else. This is what they did at the university. And, and the idea of forming my own company was so ridiculous at the time. It was such a, uh, something that just was not possible for somebody like me that I, I didn't even consider it. And so when I look back on it, you know, was that a mistake to license to Wharf to a company, et cetera? Absolutely not. I mean, that was the right thing to, to do at the time. And I, I think I would do it again every single time. And I think each inventor has to look at their own situation and decide what the best path forward for them is. And I hear what you're saying. And it sounds like there were some, some ups and downs there. So tell me what happened after that. So the technology was licensed to a company and the funniest thing happened because when, when you think you, you're going to give your technology to company and it's all, you know, puppies and rainbows and, and everything goes well, I mean, that's, that's not what happened. Um, mm -hmm. the company commercialized our equipment and they did an okay job. Um, I think, you know, they should have listened to us a little bit more closely and, you know, Every inventor thinks that though, so, yeah. <laughs> so I, that, that's not unique, but you're probably um, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so they did an okay job, but I think the problem came on the business side. And what happened is that the company and the university, and, and I'm a, this is third hand information because as the inventor, I gave away the technology to the university, the university licensed it to a company. And so yes. the, neither the company nor the university consulted with me on a daily basis. Of course. And right. Cause they, they're like, this is their business now. This isn't my yes. business anymore. Yes. And so, so this is kind of a third hand information, I guess, but, uh, but I kind of followed the saga of this a little bit. And it turns out that the university and the company disagreed on the patents and the, the, whether the patent covered what was eventually put out there into the, the market, product. et cetera. Exactly. Right. And so they had a, a disagreement on that. And there was a disagreement on royalties and, and, you know, this got kind of hot and heavy a little bit. And, and, uh, again, I don't know all the sausage making cause right. I was, uh, you know, just practicing radiology and doing my thing. And, and, um, but it became very clear to me that it wasn't a one-to-one -one correlation that you make a really good invention. And then it's, you know, it goes out into patients and everybody's, you know, that's happily ever after that became very clear to me that, that, that there were some downsides to the method that I had taken and the, and the route that I'd taken. And I do have to laugh because I know that the company did pretty well financially. That'd be my guess, but I know that the university got very little, if anything, in royalties. Wow. Um, but I do know that the inventor's share that I would receive on a quarterly basis was like $150 or something. Oh like my that. gosh. <laughs> and, and, and it, it, it was funny because oh. It Salt was more a wound for you, I guess. <laughs> That's right. It was more infuriating than anything else to have this reminder of, of how business doesn't work sometimes. And uh, despite the clinical uptake or, or something of the device. And so that was a constant reminder. And to this day we get royalty checks and my wife and I have to laugh every time we, it comes in. She generally sends me a, a text with a picture of the check with a, with a laughing emoji <laughs> next to it because uh, the numbers are really pretty small. And, uh, wow. and so we have to laugh about that. Now, what is, so they, they didn't think that the commercial invention was the same as what you had patented through Wharf. So they basically determined that they didn't have to pay you 
the royalties that they had negotiated on the commercial product that they had been selling. Correct. That's uh, that's my that's my assumption of the situation. Yeah. Okay. Right. And let me ask: Is there anything you would have done differently? I guess looking back, or would would have hoped that maybe the attorneys would have done differently, or anything along those lines that might might help our listeners? Well, when I think back on it, I'm not quite sure how we could have made the situation any better. I mean, I was in no position to become a businessman or attorney myself. I wasn't the right person to be doing these negotiations and I wasn't even at the table. And I wasn't completely in the dark, but I was semi in the dark. And I think that it was that frustration that drove me in the future, knowing that, I mean, I, I, I'm sure I probably couldn't have made the situation any better, but just not being at the table was really pretty tough. And, and that, that bothered me because any invention that, that you make, I mean, you think it's your baby and right. you know, you want your baby to be successful and to go to a good college and all that stuff. And, and, you know, I, I felt like in this point, I couldn't be the shepherd for, for what my invention was. And, uh, and that was, that was frustrating, but I think that that was just a, that was just the situation. I mean, I had licensed and given away the technology and, and that's just how the system works. And. I don't know if anybody did anything wrong or it could have been done better, but that is the downside of giving away your technology to an institution is that they're going to do what they're going to do. The big companies are going to do what they're going to do. And you as the inventor are left behind at that point. And I was not happy with that. Looking back and seeing it, you know, with new wave was different, but I know that some inventors, many inventors, when they go through a tech transfer center, they will ask if they can license the technology themselves and then build a company around it. Would you have considered that alternative now in retrospect? Well, I think maybe um, that will unfold as the story continues, because I think that this was a very good educational moment for me. And it taught me of the different ways that you can get your inventions out into the world. And one of them is through the tech transfer route, like I did the first time. And the other is exactly as you described, which is to build your own company. And as I was watching events unfold for the licensing in my original technology, I said to myself, you know, if ever I do this again, and I consider myself not a very smart person and not a very, um, I don't think anybody's person, that, so, <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I thought the chances of this actually happening again were fairly low, but if it ever does, if something happens and lightning strikes twice. I just need to do it differently. And I didn't know exactly how at that point I was going to do it differently. And that is a further part of the story that comes in later. But uh, I knew that, that I just couldn't do this again. But what happened is that as all these events were transpiring, Dieter was getting his PhD and he had written a lot of papers and done a ton of work in this area. He's an incredibly smart guy. He's at, uh, he's at University of South Carolina right now, and he was getting his PhD and was defending his thesis. And so um, I was an advisor on his thesis. And so I went over to the engineering school and Dieter gave a great presentation. And as he was speaking, the door opens and this guy walks in that is really tall and kind of put together. He had this bushy beard. He had these like really intense eyes and he was dressed in motorcycle blacks, carrying his helmet under his arm. I mean, he looked like some, some motorcycle gang dude that came into the wrong door, you know? Yeah. And, and he interrupts Dieter in the middle of this, in the middle of this really sophisticated defense, he starts giving Dieter the business and I'm kind of taken aback by this. I'm like, who is this guy? He's like, you know, right. Some guy off the street. Roughing up your, your technical partner. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And Dieter, you know, had spent several years of his life working on this and, and this guy's just giving him the business and I'm getting a little offended by it. But I realized that every time this guy opens his mouth, it's this incredibly intelligent stuff comes out and, <laughs> and you know, don't judge a book by its cover. There's your lesson. It's right. It's right. <laughs> I, I learned that, uh, in high school and in college and medical school, that brilliance and intelligence comes in every shape and size. And man, I mean, this guy, I, I was sitting there as, as time went on and I started listening to him more and more. I, I'm just really drawn to him. I mean, he has a, a particular way of speaking that's very authoritative and, and he obviously, I mean, he's, he just knows what he's talking about and I can't reconcile that with how he looked and, and, uh, and how he made his entrance and everything. 
And so after the defense, I came up to him and I said, why were you giving Dieter such a hard time? And he said to me, you know, this whole thing with radio frequency is interesting. And I understand why you did this, what you did, but I think that you're, you have the wrong energy source. I said, the wrong energy source. And he said, you know, you can do all this better with microwaves and like microwaves. And of course I knew nothing about microwaves besides the oven that's in my kitchen. I had no idea what I was talking about. And, and so I tried, I'm like, well, who are you? And, uh, it turned out his name was Dan Vander Whitey, and he's a professor of electrical and computer engineering at UW and is like the, you know, one of the top professors here. His expertise is in radar and sensing and RFID, you know, very sophisticated electronics. And he thought that what we were doing was incredibly primitive. Um, and he, you know, he's, he's kind of like, this is the stone age, what you guys are doing. And you'd have much more control with microwave. It would be tissue agnostic. It would be much faster, et cetera. So I'm like, okay, well, put your money where your mouth is, you know? Yeah, there you go. And, uh, and so he said, and I said, well, can you prove it? And he asked me, well, what is your preferred method of getting energy into the body? And I told him that we, we want to put it in through a needle, not a catheter or, or, I mean, there's many ways to get energy into the body, but we want to do it with a straight, sharp catheter. And he said, well, just give me one then. And, uh, so I went back and I gave him an 18 gauge spinal needle and he took it back to his lab. And within 24 hours, he had made a better ablation than we could make with any radio frequency system. And I, I was just blown away. I'd never seen anything like this before. And so I said, Dan, I hate to tell you this, but we're going to work together. Whether we want to or not, we're going to, we're going to work together. And so he said, okay, well, let's do it. And, uh, he said, you know what, why don't we each assign one of our students to this as a project? And then, you know, you and I will oversee the project. And, you know, we'll see if we can make something of this. And it was all, at that time, it was all an academic, you know, thing. And we wanted to publish papers and write grants on it, the usual stuff. And so Dan had a really smart graduate student at the time named Chris Brace. And I had a really smart MD, PhD student named Paul Lasky. And we said, okay, Paul and Chris, can you just like work this now for your PhD projects? Can you work on this? And the two of those guys, they were incredible. They got together and they worked day and night. They ended up publishing like 30 or 40 papers on, on wow. this. And, uh, the two of them, I mean, I seriously, like they were, they really drove this and the two of them got together and they just figured everything out about microwave and how to deliver it into the human body. And I laugh when I think back on it, because there are some times I, I wish I had done a better job of taking pictures and, and recordings and stuff at the time, because there was a day I remember where Dan and Chris walk into the lab and they're carrying a microwave oven and these World War II waveguides that were like six feet long. They look like logs. They were these green camouflage colored logs that they were carrying into the. And what is the, a waveguide? Well, I still don't quite understand it, but <laughs> what it, what it does is it, it focuses the energy that comes out of the power source. And so what they did is, and these things were World War II surplus. And they had, I, mean, I seriously, they had camouflage and they had that military lettering on them and stuff like that. I have no idea where Dan got these. And Dan, the biker, this is Dan, the biker. Here you are. All right. That's exactly right. Who, of course, I realized oh, in a very short period of time is this uber genius guy. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, he's just, hopefully you'll have a chance to talk to him in the future. He's, he's a triathlete and a, I mean, he's an incredibly accomplished person and the more you get to know him, the more you understand how much depth there is there. And, and, uh, and Chris, likewise, I mean, th there was a time I walked into the lab, Chris had the back of this microwave oven torn off. He was bolting these World War II surplus waveguides to it. And then, I mean, seriously, these are the size of a log. And then oh at the end gosh. of the log, they put this little tiny needle sticking oh out gosh. the end of this log. And I mean, it was the most Frankenstein looking setup you've ever seen. And so then once they're finished assembling all this, <laughs> they, 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 we're, we're sitting there looking at each other. Okay. What do we do now? And we put a dead pig liver at the end of this needle. And Dan is like, okay, I think we need to turn this thing on. And then we realized that we didn't know how to turn on this microwave oven. So <laughs> Dan walks over, he puts on safety glasses and then he walks over 
to the microwave oven and he hits the popcorn setting. Oh my <laughs> gosh. And that's how we turned on the microwave oven because they had spent all the time trying to figure out how to get the power out of the microwave oven, but we forgot to like put an on switch on the right. thing. So, so that's how they did it. They used the on switch. It was so funny. And what happened next was that the uh, ablation started to form and it looked really good. And we're all like, wow, this is a great ablation. But then we looked over and the microwave oven started to smoke and the sparks started to fly between the waveguide and the microwave oven. And we all dove for cover and, uh, and ran around behind the safety wall. And, uh, and the thing basically exploded. Luckily, nobody was injured. But I remember Dan standing there with these safety glasses on looking like, you know, Doc Brown out of, yep. <laughs> out of uh, Back to the Future. Yep. And we're like, oh my God, you know, there's this big explosion. And, you know, we're looking between the microwave oven and then we look at this ablation that we formed, which is really good. But the whole thing's like smoking and, you know, not working well. And, and, and Dan's like, cool, man, this is really cool. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, I and, love that. And that's how we built our first prototype of the microwave system. That is incredible. Uh, and then, and then the seed of new wave was, was planted. It sounds like. Exactly. And you know, the story, the radio frequency story overlapped a bit where at the time that we had built this prototype, the company that had been working on my other technology on the radio frequency technology, uh, had come into our lab and we had showed them that we're working on, on this, on, on microwave. And, and they said that they wanted to license that too. And because of all the disputes and all that, that had happened about the patents and royalties and licensing and all this stuff, I knew that I just didn't want to go that route. And so I told them that I think that I was going to do this myself. And what did they say? Yeah, that was really interesting moment. I, I remember it like it was yesterday and, and Chris and Paul were actually there when this happened and we were talking about this not too long ago. And, and I think that this moment was really the genesis of new wave where their attorney was a really tall guy and a big guy, you know, and I'm a little Asian guy. And he came really close to me, closer than is probably politically correct. And he, he looked down at me and he said, Dr. Lee, you might think that you're a smart guy, but I will roll over in my grave if you're ever able to do anything commercial with this. And you should license this to us. Oh my gosh. And Strong arm. Yeah, I mean, he nothing really, short of that. That's right. That's right. And at that moment, um, I knew that we were going to have to do this ourselves and we were going to do it right. And and it was interesting because there was a lot of silence in the lab. And I think Chris and Paul's eyes were really wide. And, you know, for anybody that knows me, I mean, I come from a family that, you know, we're fighters, you know, and, uh, and we don't back down from much. You know, you heard the story of my family being raised in mm -hmm. the ghetto and, and mm -hmm. they, the things that they had to do to get out of there um, wow. were, were really tough. And, and I feel like, you know, I come from that. And so looking back on it, I mean, that was the moment that it was all decided. And wow. it was maybe a week later, Dan came over to my house with a six pack and, and our kids are about the same age. And so they were running around the backyard yelling and, and having fun. And, and Dan's like, we got to make a company out of this. It's, there's no question. And so of course, not knowing anything about how to form a company, we, I mean, Dan, Dan knew because he had, he had formed another company that was, that had actually exited by that time, I think. And in the sensing, you know, in, in the sensing space. And so he knew about it and said, you know, let's incorporate. And we incorporated in Delaware because, you know, I'd seen enough Shark Tank to know that, that something about Delaware, that's where you're supposed to form a company. I had no idea why or, or, or anything, but, uh, but so we incorporated in, in Delaware and we decided to do this. Dan had some background, thank goodness, because I knew nothing about it. And, uh, I mean, the only businesses that our family had ever been involved with was, you know, Chinese laundry and, and, and restaurants that failed. You know, I had no background of this. And luckily Dan, he had gotten his PhD at Stanford and had been involved with some of the entrepreneurial startups there. And I think that's how he got his, his background in, for his sensing experience. Company. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so he could kind of lead me, which was really good. It wasn't quite the blind leading the blind. No, uh, no, that's least, incredible. At least in medical devices, you know, Dan didn't have experience with medical devices, of course, and, and, and I had only, my only experience was licensing before. And so I would say to those out there, you know, that are thinking about this, when you look at people that have been successful 
you think to yourself, oh, it was inevitable that those people would be successful. But, but it's not. It's not inevitable. I mean, I was so ignorant and so stupid and, and got so lucky to, to run into to Dan and to have Dieter help me and to have Chris and Paul, you know, and, and it was really more fortune than it was, um, than it was any particular business savvy on my point. And, and so I would say to the listeners that are considering making your own company, I think the only thing that, that I did right was try to find people that knew more about this than I did and, and were more experienced and were smarter and, and had the ability to, to do things that I couldn't do. I think if I have any talent in the world, it is being able to recognize people like Dieter and Paul and Chris and, and, and Dan, especially that have skills and abilities that, that I don't have. And then the one other thing that I've learned, I guess, working with a lot of people is that choose your partners wisely. These are people that, that I would trust with my life. And I have had some bad experiences working with people that weren't like that. And you should rapidly try to figure out who are the people that you can trust and, and you can work with and have a way of doing things that there's no blame. There's no taking credit. There's no, you know, it's just, we're just doing this because we need to do it. And if you can find those people, those are the people that you can take all the way to the finish. I was fortunate, you know, there were some people that I encountered in my career, both my academic career and the, my business career that weren't exactly like that. And I think I quickly was able to pivot and find, you know, the people that I knew that I was going to be friends with and, um, and colleagues with, uh, for the rest of my life. And if I would give any advice to prospective entrepreneurs is find those people, the, the, the people that you can stand working with that, yes. that, you know, your personality gets along with that you feel are really honest and that they bring talents to you that, that you just don't have. And, Absolutely. you know, as a doctor, we're trained a certain way and we know certain things, but, um, and doctors are very smart people and they think, you know, they think they're so smart, they can do anything, but I guarantee you. <laughs> You cannot, there are just things you cannot do. And, and your background is just not good enough to, yep. to do this on your, on your own. And I know Brian, you know, this too, through your own entrepreneurial experience. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I will second that 100% is finding good partners is, you know, it becomes a synergistic and it's not a one plus one equals two. It's one plus one equals three. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, it can be the inverse if you, if you don't have that. So. Uh, but that is a fantastic place to stop. And I cannot wait to get into the later parts uh, of New Wave. But I think that is a, a great segue into that. And uh, what I like to do at the end is a, is a little bit of a recap here of some points that I thought might be helpful for the listeners. So number one, everyone's a product of their own history and experience. You gave a very eloquent background on your history and your family's history and how that motivates you. And I think in general, using your specific experience to leverage to solve problems in a unique way. And that brings us to pay attention to the problems you encounter. You encountered a lot of several of these problems during your clinical trials, you're working early with cryoablation, and there was a successful business, maybe even a couple on the other side of that. I will say as my caveat to add in there, as I thought about it, there are always more problems than there are successful products or businesses. That's for a reason. Some problems are worth paying to solve and other problems, maybe not. So for our listeners out there, always filter your clinical problems through some form of analysis that includes a market size, a reimbursement pathway. Uh, how much money and time is it going to take to solve it? I think your problem was huge. Uh, Fred, I think what you were, what you were working on was a massive problem and, and it, it became a very big and successful business. Uh, but it's not always that way. A lot of the problems we come across are, are smaller and maybe there isn't a solution to them that would have a place in the market. Yeah. And I would add one caveat to that, Brian, is that Please. it's important that you approach the problem with vision. Why I say that is because there were many times when I was working on something where very experienced, uh, very well-known and renowned physicians said to me, and, and this was back in like the 1980s and the 1990s, they were, they would say something to me like, Fred, I don't understand why you're working on that. What we have right now is so perfect and, and works so well. Why are you wasting your time working on, on switching or, or on, 
on microwave ablation or something. And, you know, that is, it, it sounds in retrospect, it sounds laughable. But if you think about your own situation right now and everything that you do, you think, you know, you want to have pride in what you do and you want to think that what you're doing is really good for patients and all that stuff. And, and it is. But the way to think about this, in my opinion, is no matter what you're working on and, and, or, or how you're, you're looking at something in the clinical world, it's inevitably going to be seen as primitive down the road. Even though it's, it seems to you it's good enough now, it will not be good enough in the future. I mean, think about all those surgeons in the Civil War that were amputating legs when people right. got their you know, foot shot. And that at the time was considered state-of-the-art medicine, and they see no reason why that should change. You know, it, it takes vision to understand that, you know, you can do something better and in our case, less invasive and more effective, but not everybody can see it. And even you may not see it at the time. So when you see a problem, think about with engineering, with innovation, can it be better? And is that driving towards what the future is going to look like? And, and we all know the future is going to look less invasive, more effective, you know, with fewer complications and, and more precision. And so apply that filter when you're thinking about problems. That's, that's perfect. I think having vision is one of the, is, is probably the one thing that can separate coming up with ideas versus an entrepreneur who brings a device to market is having that vision. And the vision isn't a, a vision of the future. And the vision isn't just, oh, I, you know, uh, I think ablation is going to be important. The vision is used to attract other people to the project or the company or the concept. Yes. And you use that vision to recruit. I mean, it's very clear throughout, uh, throughout the stories that I've heard from you that you are convincing people. You say, oh, they just came into my life. No, no, you, you definitely had to convince and show that initial vision to bring people to it so that they can help you, whether it's an engineer or a business person, as we'll find out later with Laura King. And that is, that is so critically important to be able to convince other people that the vision that you're building is worth pursuing and spending a lot of your life, blood, sweat, and tears and money on. Yes. And that's, that's critically important. And that segues very well into it takes a team. And I love what you did when you got out there and you started knocking on doors initially. And when you met, was it John Webster? Yes. And you knocked on doors. You just said, Hey, I need to go to the engineering building and find somebody who knows about tissue and electric current. And, uh, you know, you found the guy who invented tasers and that's a great story, but it's getting out there and finding that those teammates that complement your skills. And, uh, next moving to intellectual property is very important, you know, file early and often. I'll just add that part in there, but consider using your tech transfer center to help file and reduce costs initially, uh, when you're trying to evaluate a technology, you know, you can ask yourself, how much risk do you want to take? early on in a, in a technology's uh, life. Um, maybe you want to start a company or maybe you just want, you want it to be a product and you can, you can send it out to a uh, tech transfer and they can market it to a, to a company. Next, let serendipity happen. Uh, I love that you went to the thesis defense and you clearly met somebody that changed your life in, in Dan, the biker who, who nobody would have seen coming, who he, it was so simple to him. The problem was simple to him. I think that is so interesting that you guys have been grinding on this and the whole industry is springing up. And so this one guy was out there who had the solution that really could take the technology to the next level. And you let serendipity happen by going to this meeting and then approaching Dan, which I think is fantastic. Yeah, and I think that you, you have to be humble enough to, when somebody says that uh, Laura King, uh, who's my perpetual CEO, always says, it's tough when somebody tells you your baby is ugly. Yeah, and, uh, that's right. And I think, you know, but I think it's really important as an entrepreneur to be humble enough and to stay open enough that when somebody criticizes what you're working on, not to become defensive and shut down, which is maybe the, the natural response to, to that, but to try to listen even more carefully up to what they're saying. And, you know, I'm glad, I mean, I'm a stubborn person and everybody will tell, tell you that. And I think for some reason with Dan, I mean, I, I just, I, I, when he opened his mouth, I'm thinking to myself, I'm in the 
presence yeah. of true genius. And right. at least I was smart enough to shut up and to listen to him because totally. that guy has completely changed my life. And that's you know, incredible. Yeah. We're, we are as close friends as you can be. And, you know, this is a guy that comes from a completely different background than me. And yet my family, he's the adopted son of our Chinese family now. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's, you don't know when somebody like that's going to come into your life, especially when you're in an environment like this, where yes. everybody that you encounter is incredibly smart and accomplished in their field. And, and so I would just say, be open and humble and listen when, and, and you, you should invite criticism to, to what you're doing and then listen really carefully when somebody criticizes you. And that might sound like some wisdom and I'm, I don't think I'm so good at it myself, but, uh, but I'm trying. Absolutely. I think it's great advice. And then for that, and the last one in the segue is basically the, the anger that spurred you to start a company based on the, the attorney from the, the company who wanted to license it and, and you did not. And, and I think it's, it's taking sometimes chips on your shoulder can be chips in your pocket. And I heard that once and you can use tough situations as motivation. I don't think anger is, is something to be avoided here. I think that was something that you turned into uh, motivation and it really drove you guys to say, you know what, we're going to show that guy. And you did. And that's something we can, we will get into on the, on the next show. I can't wait to discuss it, but thank you so much, Fred, for, for sharing your story, your background, your learnings of the early stages of New Wave and how you got into ablation. And we so look forward to having you back and, and hearing more of the story. Thanks so much, Brian. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at Backtable Innovation on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable Innovation is produced and hosted by Brian Hartley, Aaron Fritz, and Eric Yamaker. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from Ann Dang. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. And Dana Parker. Thanks again for listening. See you again next week.